Hello, I'm Ben from 3D Footprint, and today we're going through some of the weird and wonderful materials in 3D printing. Mostly what we're focusing on today is FDM printing, but if you have any questions about any other kind of printing techniques or resin or anything like that, feel free to interrupt. If you're interested in any materials and have any ideas, feel free to speak up, raise your hand. I don't want to hear any of the ideas you have, we can tell you the feasibility of it and all that sort of stuff. And people on the live stream, feel free to send through any questions you have while we're going through stuff. Um, next slide. So, a basic rundown of some of the basic materials. PLA is a super easy to print biodegradable material. It's the most common kind of 3D printing material, and it comes in, it's really easy to come in a wide variety of colors and dyes. It's also very easy to mix additives into it, which might cost in that one. There are PLA resins that you can get for resin printers, as well as PLA standard for FDM. And you can get lead filled PLAs, wood filled PLAs, metal filled PLAs, loads and loads of stuff. It's, it's the most common 3D printed material. A lot of prototyping is done with PLA. Then you've got ABS, which is the most typical kind of plastic that you've used for like a car's dashboard. It's made out of oil. It's not super great for the environment, but it's, it's got super high heat resistance. So if you need something that is going to last for a long time, it's super good for that. The PLA will biodegrade over like a period of time, but the ABS won't necessarily. You know when you hear about plastics and plastic bags at the bottom of the ocean for so many thousands of years and all that sort of stuff, that's more typically ABS stuff. Um, then we've got PETG, which is chemically resistant, has the high temperature of ABS, and it's transparent, it's very easily recyclable. It's made out of a natural gas and a mixture of other materials, but it is biodegradable, but it takes longer than the PLA. Polypropylene is what's used for, for like most disposable water bottles and food safe items that are meant to be cheap and effective, but sometimes other things are made out of it as well. We have polypropylene that we're going to be talking about today. Next slide. Any of those um, UV resistant or usable for outside? We do have materials we're talking about today, uh -huh. but these materials aren't UV resistant. You'll get weathering or yellowing on all of these when they're left outside in ultraviolet conditions for long periods of time. So, today we're starting off with East Sun PVA plus water soluble. It's a material that basically dissolves in water. It's used often for being a support, as demonstrated here. So, the yellow piece being printed out PLA plus, like the other company passed around. The salt water soluble piece you print as a support for the structure, and then you submerge it in water and it dissolves. And I'm going to be showing that. It takes about an hour for this to dissolve by putting this up with water. The show. It's a very similar material to the EVA glue. I you could drink it for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. The, uh, it does turn into a gluey water mix, but the biodegradability of it is also a massive benefit. So if you're printing with PLA and using this as a support, you can have like biodegradable pieces that use biodegradable support material. And if you want to get them, clean them up, you just dip them in the water, leave them for however long it's going to take for that part to dissolve. And then you've got your piece of like the arch or the overhang that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Other support materials have to be like removed manually and all this sort of stuff, and it can damage the print if you're not careful. This can be a lot easier than doing all those. Um, it works with PLA, ABS, pet G's, and nylons, which are very common materials. It dissolves faster than regular PVA. That's the benefit of the EPVA plus. It's also very cost effective, and the parts that we're doing today will dissolve within about an hour. To add on to that, when we do different types of PVA materials, uh, so for talking, say if we are needing any ABS kind of print, uh, filament printing, which is high heat compared to the low temperature like PLA. We do PVA-S material, which is poly PVA uh, styrene, so it prints at 230 degree temperature, so it matches up with the ABS, so it won't uh, ooze out or get overly cooked while you're printing it. Uh, we do uh, high TLA by Kapathy, uh, so there's a wide range we do do stock and can be used into different kind of places. Materials. Most of the materials that I'm talking about today, we have like options for multiple brands of the same thing. So, uh, example, we're talking about a carbon fiber based material. We have multiple carbon fibers from the same brand and multiple carbon fibers from different brands. 
So if you need like a specific amount of strength with a specific amount of chemical resistance, there can be an exact match for the material that you need. The best way to use, oh, if you wouldn't mind to go back. Sorry, no. The, a great way to use the PVA is with like a dual nozzle printer. So you have one nozzle that's set up to print the PVA and one nozzle that's printed up to print your main pieces material, PLA, ABS, etc. And then you can have them doing, like it will do the layers at the same time. Otherwise it doesn't really work. You can print solid like PVA materials on their own if you wanted a part that is water soluble. For example, if you needed a pipe to be held open until water was flowing through it. Something like that, like something um, flexible pipe to be held open. You could print that out of PVA, put the water through it, it would dissolve, and then it would be able to function. So, what, what's its kind of lifetime in normal kind of humidity? How long will this survive for? Does it have to be at 100% water, or will it degrade over time? If it's left in a high humid uh, environment, it will, uh, because it's like a PVA glue. So, if it's too much um, wet, in that air kind of thing, it will degrade itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, but water is the fastest way to do it. But if you're creating something which for talking sake it requires X amount of days before the inner thing will be revealed for talking sake. Um, so yeah, you can leave it um, in a in a environment where it's a high humid and you can use it that way. Yeah, because it's I just think it's ironic to print a little snowman. I was wondering if he might actually melt. It will, but he's all up, so he'll be alright. Ah, that's all right. <laughs> the um, the PVA doesn't last very well in high heat environments either. Like, right. there's like sixty Celsius, which is like the cast dashboard can easily get to that. It will just go. But PLA, um, which is the most common three D printing material, that isn't super good for the high heat resistance either. <coughs> Even though it's like super easy to print with and super popular. There are limitations to all of these materials you need to be aware of yeah. what you can and can't do with them. Flexibles, for example, are very difficult to print with, but then you can only do the results with those. Um, next slide. So now we're going to be talking about Polyterra. PLA. So this is a great example. So this is a great example of a PLA, and this one is actually industrially compostable within 60 days. So you can print your parts off, send them, and when you're done with them, they can be gone 60 days into like mush. Um, they're made out of a mixture of corn and rice starch, and they're easily paintable, they come in a lovely matte finish, uh, they come on recycled cardboard spools, so it means it's much more environmentally friendly. And the recycled cardboard spools can then again be recycled when you're finished with them. Uh, a lot of brands of material do come on like ABS or other plastic spools, but a big move in the industry right now is moving towards recycled cardboard spools. With our own stuff as well, we are going towards that in the future. And a lot of the materials that our own brand that we offer do come with the recycled cardboard spools. It comes in a bunch of different colours, which are all really nice. The unique matte finish is a big selling point of it. You can, most PLAs, like with the elephants, they come out with more of a gloss. For example, do you want to pass it out? Not much. Um, they come out with more of a gloss. Uh, and every school they plant, every school that you purchase, they plant a tree for in one of four countries Iceland, Romania, Denmark, or Spain. You don't get to choose the country, unfortunately. But they, they plant them within Europe. If you buy one within North America, they have places that they plant them in there as well. So it's like super environmentally friendly. With the production of carbon produced by the manufacturing of each spool being four kilogram, and it takes one year for the tree to mature, and each mature tree plant takes 22 carbon, 22 kilograms of carbon out of the atmosphere, leads to a net saving of 18 kilograms of carbon for that year, the second year of that tree's life. But the tree, they don't chop it down. This is like permanent reforestation. It's not like they're chopping it down for like wood production or anything like that. Because a lot of the time when places like we planting trees, sometimes they're be a bit iffy because they're doing like replanting where it's used for forestry so in 20 years the tree will be chopped down that's not really helping the cause is it it's just going to take it away after a while but this material has proved quite popular and it's just it's incredibly easy to print that elephant isn't that's our regular pla plus reason but the matte ones are next slide 
So this is a super cool one. These are composite metal. Uh, today we have brass, steel, and some rusted iron. So what it is, it's a mix of the, the blends are here on the screen, so like 60 to 45 percent between the metal and the PLA plastic. And the plastic, the PLA is heat treatable. So if you put it in a toaster oven, you can heat treat it and then it's even more heat resistant. So you can have it like above 60 Celsius, stronger than regular PLA. With the iron, you can rust it and it's ferromagnetic. So that means magnets will stick to it. You can use it as a magnetic piece. You can print this on a standard machine as well. You don't need any specialist hardware or anything like that. It's just super easy. It's metal dust mixed in with the plastic residue, mixed in with the plastic resin. So when they're producing it, they're mixing it. For example, with the brass, 61% to 49%, and then 61% uh, to 39%, 45 to 55 and so on and so on. It comes in five different variations, brass, iron, bronze, steel, and copper, and they all have their own properties, and the strength does vary a little bit between them. They aren't super high strong, like it's not like you're printing actual steel, it's not going to have that sort of strength. Um, the, it's not like a, a welded metal piece, it's metal powder within plastic, if that makes sense. Like the resin plastic is holding it together like glue, so these can't be used as like high strength parts. But for decorative pieces, especially like cosplay and um, like if you wanted to display like a statue to be made out of what looks like metal, it's fantastic. Yep. We've got a question from the chat. Yes. Um, so I was saying, does the metal filament need a certain type of nozzle? Um, because like sometimes we normally use brass nozzle, but it's just steel and it's sort of harder times. Um, by the time it's kind of abrasive, so you would need hardened steel nozzle for these. Hardened oh, steel, um, yeah. yeah. And what about use like ruby nozzles as well? Or, you I can think. use a ruby nozzle as well. Yeah. yeah. You can. A ruby nozzle would be like above hardened steel in terms of like, it's, if they do the same job, but the ruby nozzle would last much longer. Because it's actually a ruby that they drill the hole through being the tip of the nozzle. It's super cool technology. Is this one that's been smoothed or something? It's yes. Like... It's sanded, yes. So because it is metal like filament, you can rust the iron one in a salt water solvent solution over the course of I think two days that one was, a few days, um, for the iron to make it look rusty. And it smells rusty and feels rusty, like rust. <laughs> You'll be smelling when I pass around the wood likes, don't worry. Just thinking of us and I encourage everyone to anti back their hands when they're done because we're passing things around, just as like a word of warning. Um, not that I think anybody here is, you know. Uh, so with the metals, you can polish them and poutine them and all that sort of stuff. You can get really, really good finishes. So do you know how long that they were working on that boat, that venture? I'm sorry? Do you know how, how what sandpaper grid that was? Um, it was quite a few sandpaper, starting with 320 grit paper and then uh, wet and dry, 1,000 grit, 2,000 and then 3,000. Uh, it took a while to and get that lovely smooth finish. Uh, I never did it personally. And it's hand set, and if you use machines or anything, it will just burn it off. Kind of things. It's got a fair bit of weight to it as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's the dense. best thing about the metal filaments. You, you can feel the weight on them. So, as Ben mentioned, if you're printing a burst or like a historic figure or anything like that, you would physically feel the weight of the whole object as well. And with the iron one, some of uh, the people who did project, uh, if you guys Google on uh, or search on YouTube, they created the mortar and the core was printed in the, uh, the iron, magnetic mm -hmm. iron, and they slotted in the neodymium magnets in there, the copper coils and all that sort of stuff. And it, it printed and it worked, uh, but of course, by the time it exploded, <laughs> but it was all 3D printed. Um, so it can't replace the actual mortars. But it can be worked. Did we bring a magnet with us? No. So, do you guys have a magnet on hand that we could show the mag how strong the magnet is? Always. Because <laughs> it's it's stronger than you think for being a plastic blend, at least by my expectation. I thought you know sometimes you get a, a metal object and it's like kind of magnetic. These are like properly. We can't have old school magnets. You have the. That's the steel drum line. They are always magnets. Well, they're still sticking on one another. They're not near the new video. 
Yeah. 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 I'm sure there's a, a ton of engineering use cases that everybody will be able to come across whenever you need something just magnetic enough to do it in 3D printable. Some little piece of a motor, or you could use it to build a sensor, for example, and I would like to know that you can metal go past it. It's because it's steel leaf. So it's polishable, you can it. Um, again, it's also the same as protoplastic making material with HTPLA, which is heat treated, which means you can put it in like a little toaster oven or your oven or whatever, leave it in there for a certain period of time at a certain temperature, then the piece you come out of it is heat resistant up to much higher temperatures than any standard PLA, but it doesn't affect the print quality. So you're still able to do the super easy printing, then you've got a part that you can leave outside of in a car's dashboard for like ages and it won't do anything. It won't could you thermoform it before you put it in the oven? Uh, what do you mean, heat treat it before you... No, we try it. Yeah. No, we try it. I, I make prosthetics, that's the name. So what we do is normally for the, the wrist ornaments, we print them flat and then put them in boiling water. Mm -hmm. And then we can form them around the wrist. Um, it's... I don't think it... I don't know if it's not possible. Does that make sense? Peel. Which material? Which piece of material? Which material? HTPLA. It should, yeah. Um, no, 80 80 degrees, degrees, like it's not 80 degrees. Uh, 70, 80 degrees, you can do the thermal. Mm -hmm. Because it's PLA based. So the PLA, normal PLA, the DIT, the normal PLA, whatever it's not handy. So if thermal form is just like any other, it should be indestructible. Yeah, um, but if you guys are doing like uh, annealing the parts or baking the parts, just make sure if it's printed with supports, leave the supports on. Otherwise, it will sag with the heat. Um, so remove the supports after uh, it's been removed. But I don't believe that these demos that we have today have been heat treated, as far as I'm aware. Uh, no, not these. No. Ones. So like, it doesn't change the finish or anything like that once the heat treatment has been done. Like the, the part still feels and looks the same. So like the finish that you see there is the finish that you get, sort of thing. Next slide. Sorry. Now, everything good on the Twitch, yeah? Uh, yeah, I was just answering because I'll be questions. Yeah. yeah, I think we're up to about 10, uh, 10 people on there. And any questions okay now? Uh, no, we're all covered. So next one is flame retarded Firewire ABS. So these were both set on fire. You can see this has melted and formed a little bit, but this is self-extinguishing material. So I'm going to pass those around. So regular PLA and the ABS as a comparison. So you can use this if you're in an environment where a fire starting is quite a serious and legitimate concern. You can have parts made out of this and you know that they won't actually catch themselves. And if they are over a fire, they will collapse onto it and extinguish it. Um, it's, a, it's an odd material to print with. It, with this an ABS, you need to have a <coughs> close environmental ventilation because the fumes are hazardous. But even for an ABS, it smells really bad when you're printing with it. It just smells like absolute poison. Um, <laughs> we printed, when we printed this off, we did it in an enclosed printer and printed it off and then opened it up in a room that we, was like an office part, basically, and we stunk it out for ages. Now, flame retardant doesn't mean fireproof. It will still melt when you get up to high enough temperatures. Um, but its last transition temperature is about 105, so that's the point where it becomes like soft. Do you know what I mean? It'll start to fall under its own weight and things like that. So you're easily able to use this in really in relatively high heat environments, like anything in the home would probably be okay and things like that. Um, as Ben mentioned about the fire retardant filaments in here and the ABS, uh, we do do stock other filaments which are fire retardant uh, polycarbonates and um, which can be used much easier and work easier. You don't have to have a closure. 
Uh, this is an abrasive, isn't it? Uh, no. No, this is not an abrasive material, so you don't need a hardened steel nozzle um, with this material or anything like that. You just print it on your, on your printer. And <coughs> 3D X Tech is a very interesting company. They make so many fascinating. I think I've got quite a few of them on here actually. They make so many fascinating and like high grade engineering materials, which have got like really unique, really unique use cases. Um, does anybody have any questions about anybody? Quick in the chat, yeah. 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 Sorry. This is antibacterial by Pocket 3D. So we've got a few just like plastic bars printed out of it. It comes in three colors. It's super easy to print. It's FDA and EPA approved for medical use. So if you are in a, let's say, prosthetics, you needed something that was, you know, needed to be antimicrobial, you can use it and it's certified and it's got the paper on it. Those are actually door hooks, so you can use them to hook open doors. I don't know if you remember people selling them at the beginning of the pandemic. The uh, blue and the green. So you can put door handles open or Fridges or whatever it is that you need to open. If you're going to do this though, would you not need to make sure your 3D printer was sterile and new and whatever? You need to make sure it's clean and loud and all that sort of yeah. stuff. So if I go out there, I actually made a, um, uh, 3D printed a uh, vein finder using um, LEDs with, a, uh, with the right uh, wavelength because it cost thousands of pounds but you can knock them up for about 15 quid. Um, and uh, that, that was used. Uh, by somebody who had total cancer to make them fun of like very easily. That would be perfect stuff to use for that, but I didn't want to shoot them all the other. Oh, that's impressive. It's, uh, it's currently in sale as well, so. Uh, Do you want any? Here we go. We've seen some more people with cancer. A lot of these uh, high grade materials don't often have as much colour variety as standard materials, but this comes in three colours, which is nice, particularly because sometimes medical equipment does need to be made for children. And if you want something that can be bright and colourful, it doesn't make it seem as uh, aggressive. Do you know what I mean? Or as threatening. Exactly. It doesn't seem as threatening. Um, NASA have tested with it to avoid contamination and long term supply supplies, but they have plastic equipment and handles and things like that. Because they're having people coming in and out of space stations inside rockets. Let's say a certain section of it might not be touched for months and months on end. If it's antimicrobial, 98% of everything that's on there will just die while it's not being touched. So if it isn't wiped over by some small little mistake where that particular part isn't touched by the antibacterial material that they use, um, it will all be good. Uh, so you, you're, you're telling us a lot about the advantages of each of these materials. What's the disadvantage of these kind of materials? That particular one is it's, it's not super high strength. Right. Um, it's, it's very similar properties to PLA. But that's kind of a, a strength and a weakness because it's very easy to print with. Like, you can always use the default PLA settings, basically. Mm -hmm. Default speeds and uh, very, very similar print temperatures. I believe I printed that at 205 or 210. So it's, you can just use that on your standard machine once it's been cleaned out to make sure it's safe. Yeah. And the strength part is to do with because there's a copper particles infused into that filament, which is probably the natural so, so antimicrobial. That, yes, so, so that, that doesn't make it conductive then in any way. It won't be conductive. No. The, the particles are far enough to make a yeah. connection as a conductivity, but it's uh, enough in the material that you would have uh, antimicrobial properties for it. And in terms of because it's got copper in it, then does it? Change color over time? Does it tarnish? Does it go green? Does it? Can you get um, any white? It shouldn't be. No. It, it shouldn't be that much because the, the amount of copper in it is not that significant as to the the ones we just saw. The, the metal, the metal peeling, yeah. so it won't do that at all. The uh, the exact plan. I don't think is something that they published though. Um, I don't think. So. I think that's copper three D. The company specifically makes these antimicrobial materials. They don't really have like a wide range of other stuff. So like they need to keep their stuff kind of more proprietary because otherwise, mm. so let's say 3D x tech might be able to really use the same idea or <laughs> anything like that. Um, it's super important though that they've got the FDA and EPA approvals because a lot of like, let's say you're making uh, prosthetics, for example, you need those approvals sometimes in certain places in the industry things like that. It makes a big difference. All of the materials that we're talking about today, we do have material safety data sheets material sheets and all that sort of stuff. It goes into a lot more finer details about the material properties on our website. So if you're interested in thinking, oh, that one looks super cool. What is the exact tensile break, for example? There's an engineering sheet on the product page at the bottom, you know, PDF. You can read through that and find out exactly what you need. 
A lot of these engineering grade materials, or even just standard materials, they will publish like really in-depth information about the exact limits of what you can and can't do with it. Because then you can really you can really figure out what you need. Next slide. Um, you mentioned that like NASA have been tested with it. Is the intent that the test is for products printed in printed on the ground and then taken up, or have they been testing with it with a mind for like printing on the space station and, and that, you know? I don't know how 3D printing works without gravity on FDM. They successfully printed with the materials in space and they did done the live previews of them as well. For copper 3D or just 3D <coughs> Not, uh, general materials. For this specific material, I think they printed on ground to print the tests, pieces and all that sort of stuff and used them and set them up there. But so for talking, say, if you're replacing the copper, 100% copper piece with this one, so it might be much lighter. Mm -hmm. And if you're taking this into the space with you, like a just screw with the printer, if something breaks, you can always replace them. Printing. So for that perspective, yeah. But 3D printing in space in general as well, yes, it is possible. It's been done in that space. I, I believe it was packaging for sanitary products, <coughs> what they were initially talking about using it for yeah. with the NASA. So the astronauts have to keep their waste in a bag and such, and it needs to have clips and all this sort of thing. And uh, 3D printing the clips with this antibacterial material, antimicrobial, not antibacterial, I say, um, made much more sense than just like printing loads of copper pieces and setting them up every time these little clips would fly off and get lost or break or whatever. All good in the chat again? Yep. Next slide. So this is super interesting. Hollywood by Polymate. Good. Well, that's a great wood. So, in 3D printing, the main way, the bulk we've handed out, is the main way that 3D printing wood is done. So, I believe that one is our filler print, isn't it? Yeah, it's a light wood. So, a standard mix <laughs> for a. So, they've mixed sawdust in with like a resin of <laughs> plastic. So, like a standard mix might be 75% sawdust, 25% plastic. And with that, you're able to get very good like texture, it smells like wood, it feels like wood in your hand, you're able to get the right sort of weight ratio with it. Polywood is different. With normal uh, wood like materials, it's actually like really, really finely ground sawdust mixed in with the plastic resin. So you can't use like a 0.4 millimeter nozzle without any little blockages because it's a natural material. It's inconsistent in like how thick and viscous it can be. Like you can get bit, like a big bit of sawdust will go through, block the nozzle. So you have to end up using 0.5 or 0.6 millimeter nozzles in order to have a constant, consistent flow rate. Polywood is different. Polywood is made out of foam. Um, I believe it's the, it was one of the first foam lights to come out. It contains no actual wood, but you can compare the texture of the items and see that they're very similar. But unlike the sawdust based variety, like the bulb <coughs> does smell like wood. So if you smell it, it's, it's got the, the smell of real wood, because it has real wood in it. And they're able to offer those in a wide variety of colours made out of woods and all that sort of stuff. So you're able to get like rosewood or pine or whatever sign of wood you're looking for. There's probably a brand that are making something very similar to it or they're making it with the actual wood. The, the polywood is so easy to print with though. You don't, do any, don't need any larger nozzles or anything like that, it just prints wonderfully. It's one of the only foam made, it's one of the first foam based materials that came out on the market. Yeah. And it's by Polymate, which is one of the largest producers of foams. <coughs> Some really interesting stringy side please. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's we left it as it is because to show people Sorry, how the real um, Printing is when you're printing as a normal without changing the settings and yeah. as used as default. Because if you are showing 100% perfect model, no, 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 people will really expect it to be 100% perfect on their prints. So we yeah, tend to leave it as it is to give the more reality of like the prints. That's what we get. It's quite difficult over a video feed to give how much the wood lights <laughs> do feel like real wood and how like the, the smell of the object and like the texture of the object. You can see it in a picture, it just looks like a brown piece of something. But when you're actually holding it, it makes a big difference as compared to like standard PLA, like the elephant, for example, or uh, the polyterra. 
3D printed wood is always something that people who know nothing about it are always amazed by as well. So you can give them something like that's 3D printed wood. They're always like, wow. But it's not something that people think of as being a 3D printed wood material. One of the projects we did years ago, um, 2016, 2017, and there were a couple of small square pieces with a flower pattern in it, and they wanted it to be um, made in wood. Um, the company was restoring one of the trams in uh, Edinburgh, um, so they wanted those pieces to be made and uh, done printed. So you ask them why not do the seal and seal and stuff. So it takes <clears throat> quite a while to do that and it's much more expensive because the flower goes underneath and you potentially need five access uh, machines for that one. So it printed with the Hollywood and there are four corner pieces. So there is a tram in Edinburgh um, which got the printed part of the mm -hmm. So, as I was saying, there's no risk with nozzle jams like with a regular wood blade, which makes it much easier to print it. <coughs> You're just able to do what you need with the machine you already have, with sand settings and things like that. It can be used as a water type material as well, as opposed to regular wood blades, which, when they're on the spool especially, they're very prone to gaining moisture. Um, normally, you do always want to keep the spools in a sealed unit with silica gel and things like that, but especially for the wood blades, they, they just Draw the moisture out like crazy. Pretty sure you could use them as silver gels, can you? <laughs> okay. um, it has a low melting temperature of 150. So, yeah. Um, if you if it's a natural uh, wood filaments, if you guys are printing with, when you're waiting your temperatures, you can get different shadings uh, because it's an actual wood infused into it. You can sand it afterwards as a post process, and you can oil it just like your normal wood pieces as well to like get the grain yeah. out and all that sort of stuff. And you can actually, we have got an example, <coughs> you can 3D print wood grain onto the surface of the pattern with like a 3D printed texture. Oh, and wow. if you if you treat that with it afterwards, it can look really effective. <laughs> um, they can even feel right, do you know what I mean? You're not going to get, unless you paint it, you're not going to get like knobs that are actually darker and things like that, like with real wood. But if you do paint it, you can make really realistic, really real looking feeling wooden pieces. So if you wanted a, a, a wooden statue, for example, you could make it look really realistic. It's also super good to paint with as well. Hang on to it. Any progress on the church? Yeah, oh yeah. Go on. Okay, so this is the EV material that you were asking about, Tim. Yeah. So these ones are my own design. I have a 30 year old convertible car and the clips that hold the roof down broke. My car is from Japan and I cannot get these little clips that, I have, that are going around now. And because it's a convertible car and the roof is down in the summer, I needed something that was UV resistant, temperature resistant, so it could be left out in the winter, in the cold, when it gets down to like minus whatever, it could be left out during the summer, during a hot day, and then it would melt. So the best material for that that we offer is ASAS. ASA is a, is a plastic material specifically designed for its UV resistance. It's weather resistant, so you can make a, we made a bird house out of it, didn't we? Yeah. It's been left in our boss's garden for about ooh, a year now, half a year. Two years almost. Two years now, and it still looks just as. There's absolutely no yellow, there's no deterioration to like, the build quality and the plastic itself. Um, it's low temperature resistant, so you can have it in cold environments, you can leave it out during the winter and it's not going to crack or anything like that. It might become a bit more brittle, but like it's not going to lose a significant amount of strength until you get way below, way below freezing. Um, it's in, it has an impact resistance as well as an added benefit. The X part of our fill ASAX is an additive that we mix into it that makes it much easier to print. So it prints at lower temperatures. And it means it, it's just easier to print when you get that string closer to like standard ABS as opposed to regular ASA, which some people can have issues with. Um, so, is, is this one that would have a uh, few issues? Or? No. The base, <coughs> sorry for that one. Yeah. Um, the base is ASA, then yes, it will have fumes as well. Uh, the X part is the modification on it that you can use it without enclosure. So the normal ASA or ABS, you would have to have enclosure under 10 degrees bed temperature and 245 to 265 degrees nozzle. Yeah. 
yeah. with ABSX or ASAX uh, materials. You can print on 80 degree bed without enclosures and 245 to 255 degrees nozzle temperature and it will work as normal as it can be. Uh, and it will have a strength of ASA or a tiny bit more uh, because it's been modded and modified as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the plus points towards it because it's much user friendly. I believe the tensile brake for Polymakers ASA is 42 MPA and the tensile brake for ISA is 47 MPA. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it's, it's the, mm -hmm. the measurement that engineers used to measure the, uh, the copper 3D pieces we handed out for the ISO standards for how they test the tensile strength. We actually uh, have a tensile strength tester that we can use to, when we buy materials from other manufacturers, we can test the legitimacy of their claims. So we make sure that all the materials that we sell are mashed up to the quality of the claims they make and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it comes in a wide array of colours. So for example, the one that I handed out is ASAX grey, iron grey, and that perfectly matches the dashboard and that of the car, so that's why I decided to print them. But we offer a wide variety of colours here. You can print with it, blues, dark blues, whites, blacks. So if you need like a specific colour to match something, it's like a replacement part for it's excellent for that. Cool. Um, I've got a question from um, the chat. Um, so someone in there is asking about the wood filament. So I think the chat's a bit delayed. Ah, that's okay. Hey, um, so they were saying, uh, do I need a specific printer for the wood filament? And I'll sort of follow that up with, is there anything, if you're going to be printing a lot of wood, um, what would you look for in a printer specifically? Um, you would really need at least a 0.5 millimetre nozzle, unless it's for the polywood specifically, because that's designed to not need that. Um, you can use pretty much a standard 3D printer for all of the wood lines. They Most of them don't print at particularly high temperatures or anything like that. Um, but the polywood is super easy to print with because uh, 3D printers, I don't know if you guys are aware, they come with different size nozzles. You can go down from like 0.1 to like 0.8, everything in between. So you can figure out what exactly you need. We have some very small benches printed with a 0.1 nozzle. So to shorten the answer, um, any printer can be used as long as it can replace the nozzles. Um, and for the yeah, natural woods, yeah. it needs to be a bigger nozzle. Yeah. Yeah. And for the poly woods, you can use the standard default. Mm -hmm. And any preference on what type of bed you're printing on for those? Uh, no, it, it can print on a cold bed as well um, if you don't have a heated bed. If you've got heated bed, 40 50 degrees temperature would be nice to have. Uh, alternatively, you can use the, the adhesives as well, uh, like you can use 3D vacuum here. So, any adhesive you want. Just Does that be, uh, be ASX, by the way? Yeah, ASAX. That's a amazing. The resolution on that is just bonkers. So, that clip, it does three purposes. It holds down the fabric on the roof, and it's also for the boot lid. And I printed, all, I printed three of them all in ASAX. These are actually the prototypes, the finished ones have a better quality on the underneath. And they've been in my car for like three months now. They've been absolutely perfect. I think they're actually stronger than the ABS parts that were originally in there. There's only one of the three clips was broken, but I decided to replace all of them. And I knocked that design, I have no design or 3D modeling experience. I knocked that design out about 20 years into KitKat, which is a free 3D modeling software that runs within your browser. It saves all the documents inside of it, so you don't do off storage or anything like that. Then it can directly, for some 3D printers, you can directly export the tinkerpad directly into like Hero. And you're able to make your models. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> the model making software isn't specific. It's just. You can have the bench here. Yeah, that's the whole We've got loads of freebies now for everybody who's physically here. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're not here. You should be. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's yeah. either going to struggle or quite far away. I just wanted to give a little follow up on the dissolve model. <coughs> And that everyone have a look at that. You can see the underside start to go further and it's creating a milky effect in the water. Is that so in focus? That's the PVA one, is it? Yes, yeah. it's the PVA that we started with, water dissolvable material. And uh, I'm not going to get anyone to put their hands in it, but if you do, it's actually softer than now, the credit part itself. <laughs> you can see, oh, there you go. Tim was, Poor slow, man. <laughs> Tim was very brave. Tim was very brave. It's really uh, annoying when it gets in your fingertips. 
Yeah. 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 Hopefully by the end of this you should be all gone. <laughs> oh. Don't worry, we have another one that I gave around. So one survivor. <laughs> It'll be so lonely. We can make more. <laughs> <laughs> and sacrifice <coughs> for Christmas. Only there's some kind of print the print these things. <laughs> uh, the PBA is biodegradable, so like once your glue is in the water and it's all ready, you can just throw it down the sink and that's not a problem. It's not going to cause any environmental damage or anything like that. Um, so it, it could make sense to make materials like you could make actual Christmas forces out of it, and then liquefy them, and then be gone with them, sort of thing. Yeah. Is there everything good on the chat now? All good, yeah. Do you want to go to the next slide? Uh, yeah. Ah, this is super cool. We've only just printed it for the first time. A silly and ortho. So. This is specifically designed for orthopedics, which will be interesting to you for your prosthetic work. So it's main benefit is for using in like pads, people's feet who have flat feet or feet deformity. And it's got the right amount of properties so that when it's up against skin for a long time, <coughs> for example, in the base of the skin, or a sandal or such, it won't rub or anything like that. It's got the right amount of rigidity but the right amount of flexibility. So you can use it as like a pot. You can make a seat for a wheelchair out of it. You can make pads that go into prosthetic limbs out of it that go up against the skin for long periods of time. Um, it's specifically designed for all of them. It is technically a flexible, but it's very, very rigid. So it's not super hard to print with. That was my first attempt, I believe, printing with it, and it printed out fine using the settings that they recommended. Um, 46 short hardiness stick. It's very flexible when you're when it's on the spool, but once you've actually printed with it, it does seem to rigidity <coughs> up much more. That's a design that's a scaled down version of a design that's meant to what, a chunk cut out basically of the whole shoe pad. Uh, so you'd make a whole shoe pad out of that, and you'd be able to walk on that day after day after day, and you would be able to, you wouldn't get any rubbing or sores or anything like that. But if, if you push down on it, you can see it's got some. Some flexibility, just enough. Just got a question: Is it biocompatible? So will stuff grow on it? So I think they'll think about funguses and that. They might get grow off it. It should um, not, because it's specifically designed for alcohol, so it shouldn't grow any funguses on it. Specifically, designed. it's a skin contact suit. So, so most PLAs you can print at like 50, 60, 70 millimeters a second. Most flexibles you print at like 20 millimeters a second. At least you can do a 40. So it means even though it is a flexible material, it's, it's rigid enough that it's not like a big problem to print with. Because um, obviously a lot of the time that you're printing with it, you will be doing like a whole shoe pack, which is a relatively large piece. And you want to make sure that it's not going to be a failure and all that sort of stuff. Esun actually make a machine that prints feet pads and it will do two at the same time, two 3D printer. Such as, these, these are not made out of the author material, these are made out of TPU. But this is the sort of thing you'd make out of it. So this would be someone who has a problem with like a raised arch. Which prints do at times? Do left and right? The yeah, east side. To right. The east side ortho print, uh, <coughs> shoe, shoe sole print does do left and right at the same time. And they also have a 3D feet scanner. So it scans your feet and builds the perfect model for the base of your foot so that you can be level with the ground. Wow. <coughs> there was something in London Hack Space, I was going to do that about eight years ago. Um, Oh wow. When did Eastern start doing the ortho stuff? They've been doing it for the last three, four years now. They, uh, they started a new company called ISUN for it, didn't they? ISUN, yeah. I S U N, if anybody wants to look it. Look it <coughs> um, but the ortho material will be absolutely fantastic for that machine. <laughs> but you can still print, you know, if you've got a dual nozzle printer, you can still do that, assuming the person's feet are identical, you can do left and right at the same time, or you can print them one by one with the ortho material. But it's not just limited to Feet. You can build like pads for prosthetic arms that people have to put in all the time. Um, a former co-worker I had had a prosthetic leg and he would always get terrible rubbing and that on the pads on the inside of the leg. So you'd have to replace them I don't know, somewhat regularly every few months or so. But with this, theoretically, you would need to do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super cool. <coughs> Sorry. 
So it's got glass transition temperature of about 60 Celsius, which means it's more than safe to use in and around the human body. It's not going to melt because of body heat or anything like that. Inside your shoes shouldn't be getting up more than 60 Celsius, or you're walking on coals or something. Except you're a human tortoise. <laughs> Johnny Tor. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Do you want to go there? Yeah, that's all right. There's no dye mix into it in that, and part of the reason they do that is because some people can be allergic to certain colour dyes and things like that. So the white colour that is, is quite prominent just comes from the coat, comes from the polyester that is semi crystalline which is just like the way that it's structured means that it's white, um, which is nice because a lot of the medical grade filaments, they do avoid the dyes and that can lead to like less than appealing colours. So that's a nice benefit of this. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's it. Any questions in the chat? Uh, no, just someone in the chat saying that you can use a flatbed scanner and grayscale to assess the height for if you're scanning the bottoms of feet. That's impressive. That's a, that's a super cool idea. Yeah. Uh, um, I think you do have to be conscious of the fact that your, your two points of contact in your feet are the ball of your foot and the. How is that part of your foot called? The pad? Yep. The heel and the ball and the pad. These sort of two areas where most people are like physically walking on. You wouldn't want the, the arch of the foot supported so much, would you? I don't know. Well, I have high arches, so I'm definitely able to support that. You do need to support that. <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously, we, we, can, we can design and print stuff for you, but we do that with. We talk to an orthopedic or um, someone who specializes in that sort of information. Because mm -hmm. we, uh, we, anything that we're talking about today, we have design services and 3D modelers such as Eric and our co op at You can make 3D models that you can then print on your own printers, or you can get us to print for you out of any of the materials that we've talked about today. Um, and we can design, well, we can design almost anything. We've done so many mad ideas that people have come to us <laughs> uh, Yeah, and just a shout out to. Apparently one of the uh, Swindon Hackspace members did a lot of work on using 3D printing for orthopedics. Ah, so maybe they're still a member at Swindon, so uh, yeah, cool. If, uh, if they're interested in like, you know, contacting us about doing anything with that, uh, feel free to send me an email at ben at 3 d Okay, I'll put that in your chat as well. Um, I, I would really like to like get a practical demo done of the ortho stuff. Uh, because like we had a, a lady recently who works with soft shoes and things like that. Just coincidentally, she came with her husband who was looking at something else, and she was like, "Wow, I didn't know you could do this." But having like a practical example made out of the material that's for somebody that we can show working, like in a video or something, would be fantastic. Uh, most of the time, that sort of stuff doesn't really exist because it's medical and it's private, and people don't necessarily want to talk about it or have themselves filmed and that sort of stuff. Oh, apparently the guy's name is uh, Steve Wood, also known as Gyrobot, and he's still a member, but he's not sh not sure what he's up to at the moment, so oh. there you go, he might reach out. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd be quite interested in getting some scans done, because I want to make some lasts um, <laughs> for basic shoe making, to do a lot of other working and stuff like that, so at some point I want to get on with a 3D scan. It's a bit difficult to model your foot, perfectly. But, but. They actually do two different kinds of 3D scanners for the shoes. They do one that's one foot, they do one that looks like a Roomba, with yeah. like it's a TV screen on the top. You can stand on it with both feet and it does it all at once. Um, but yeah, they're not that they're not that inexpensive though. We do have like a standard 3D scanner, but I don't know how good for it would be for the foot quality. Mm. It won't be that good. Because be that is, as they mentioned, it's more like a flatbed scanner. So it will, it will need to measure properly that how high it is and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, the, the scanners, I send got it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I so I send got it. It's like a flatbed scanner. So you put one foot at the side and just scan it. Um, it's class better than the What that was I don't know. Uh, now you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, we're on 10 of 17, I believe. So. Okay, cool. So this should be about, about halfway through. Um, I'll do the next one and then do one take for something if I'm going to break. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. 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 Uh, next one. Uh, Kimyard ABS Kevlar. We've just got this new brand. They do uh, ABS electrostatically resistant materials, and this is their new magic secret source. It's anti abrasion. So it's the same kind of Kevlar that you get from like 
bulletproof vests and all that sort of stuff. This is not bulletproof. Do not shoot somebody with a 3D printed bulletproof vest made out of Kevlar. Uh, you might be able to develop something out of it. But the whole thing is anti abrasive, so you can make gears and moving parts out of it will last for ages because there's no wear or tear. You don't need a hard steel nozzle to prove it because it's anti abrasive. That's the, you know, you don't, it's not going to have any, it's not going to have as much wear. Um, the Kevlar is quite a deep point. I don't know if any of you know the company. It's a major, major chemical and materials manufacturer. Um, terrible collectors. <laughs> <laughs> Good Kevlar, though, hopefully. <laughs> they provide the raw materials. Yeah, but they provide specifically its Dew Points brand of Kevlar for the The different chemical manufacturers have their own variations of Kevlar. Um, it's got much lower warping than regular ABS, and it's really good for drone parts. So, if you wanted to print like propellers for a drone, for example, it'd be great for that. <laughs> lots and lots. Of it's got low density. It's relatively low density compared to like the standard materials like PLA. LW uh, carbon fibers are much lower. Oh, okay. The four base materials they're quite low. Is the polywood quite light? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, the polywood is also very light. But yeah, you could. At some point, I'm going to run that through a drill. Thank you for the idea. I'm going to run that on a drill and just see how long we can run it for, film it, put it up on the social media. It's a bigger version with the DDL. We can print up the standard one off an ABS, because this is an ABS mix, so we can add it kept onto the ABS. Um, and then we can see sort of how much better it lasts. We should have a couple and uh, do our standard, you know, the standard of what, what, whatever, uh, ABS one, see which one fails first. Mm. We could see, if we could get three identical drills on stand. Aaron's looking at proving that. <laughs> uh, that's what I'd like. Um, but yeah, it's super cool. It's the first 3D printed Kevlar I believe we've had it. In none? Okay. Um, Kimio is actually a new brand that's only recently started coming into the market. They are. Kimio is. Um... <coughs> it's, a, it's a part of a company um, called Armour Group. Um, based in France, and they used to have recycled filaments called uh, OVA brands, OVA armor, and they had hips and flexible materials. The flexible materials they used to do was the French Alps, when people go for their skiing and stuff, leave their boots behind or lost, yeah, they take nice. the boots, flexible parts, recycle them, and create that flexible okay. materials out of them. And it doesn't lose any of its like rigidity on the gears or anything like that. It keeps the same level of firmness. This has been played with a whole bunch as well. It's just sitting on the desk as like a toy. A little fiddle toy that we're playing with. Um, is there any questions about the Kevlar? Which carbon fiber chains are made out of? Uh, they are polymakers, uh, co PA, um, co polymer. Uh, so it's a nylon 6 carbon fiber. Quite a lot of So PA6 and PA12, they're two kind of different types of ni uh, nylons. So PA12 is a bit softer nylon compared to the PA6 nylons. Uh, 
Uh, PS6 is a bit brittle-ish, but if you mix up with the carbon fiber, the material itself becomes very brittle. It does have an interesting finish. We, there are so many different brands that do their own carbon fibers and all this sort of stuff. If you're looking for carbon fiber based material, also it's very impressive to uh, people who are not aware of 3D printing, this is 3D printed carbon fiber. Um, there's probably a carbon fiber that fits the property that you want. The carbon adds a lot of strength to the material and it's got super high resistance to wear and tear, so like friction and abrasion. Um, the carbon fiber typically fixes walking issues the regular nylon suffers from. So, credit with nylon can be awkward for some people, especially if they're new to 3D printing. And the low density to transfer it through makes you great. Like rockets, for example, it's good for those sort of parts and all things like that because it's relatively lightweight for the strength. So you can print thin pieces out of it but still have all the rigidity and everything you need. Any questions about carbon fibers? Are they all uh, abrasive or are there any that are less abrasive? They are all abrasive, unfortunately, because it's the, it's the fibers themselves. The fibers, not the film. So uh, they'll even wear down a, a hard steel nozzle eventually, as we experienced with the Automico. They eventually wore down, didn't they? Uh, yeah, they were um, coated uh, ones. No. They were not pure hardened steel ones. They were coated with the stainless steel or something like that. So it wears them off after a couple of prints, and the brass is just like wears it off if, if you're printing a big piece. The 0.4 nozzle will become like uh, 1.2 nozzle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Prints are not quicker. Yeah. <laughs> like no point. Like, to 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 0.4 is into a 1 millimeter nozzle for this simple head trick. <laughs> <laughs> Creality hates it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a super cool material to print with. You get a unique finish. It's got a very unique texture as well, the printed pieces. Because um, you, can, you can feel the abrasion. That makes sense on on the pieces themselves. You can you can feel what the abrasive. Yeah, it's rough. Mm -hmm. um, next slide. Unless anybody. Oh, good. The, the, I mean, obviously you've got different colours here. Uh, the different materials. Sorry, the black ah. one is the carbon fiber. Yeah. The the beigey one is a different material. It's um, aramid uh, F80 by filamentum. So it's super strong filament, uh, Kevlar based as well. Ah, yes. oh, right, okay. Because I was just about to be impressed that you've got carbon, yeah, different white, things, yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah, the white one is either polycarbonate or um, HTPLA, one of the ones. Yeah. That's uh, the same as the mixture they use for the protopasta metal white. Because they do do that plastic on its own, and they, they provide that in a massive array of colours. They have multicolour filaments, so it goes from like blue to purple as you go through the spool and then back to blue. And there's glitters and all this sort of stuff. Pro has a massive array of really, really attractive materials. They have one called uh, Sunset Orange. That one is oh, it's gorgeous. And Nebula, this is? Nebula, Midnight, Nebula. Uh, Nebula. Forest Green, and the Sunset Orange. Sunset orange, I really love the sunset orange. Sorry. It goes from like an orange to yellow, so it goes back and forth, but as you're printing the piece, as it's going up, you're going like between it so the object will change colour as it goes up and down. Next slide. Ah, so that is what this is here for. Um, it's a bit unfortunate with the camera angle, isn't it? You can pick it. I can rotate around. I don't really want to move it as well. Do you hand? No, it's... You need to pick it up. How's that angle? A little bit twisting. There we go. Bit of a jaunty angle, but it, good? it works, yeah. So this wire is electrically conductive, flexible material, plastic. So this is conductive plastic, this is electrically conductive, flexible plastic. And when it's creating the circuit, it creates the noise. It's one of those um, you have to try and hook it round the whole thing, sort of toys. Got the way to the end. I'm not good enough to do it, especially while I'm talking. Let's see if we can give it a go. Oh, it looks really easy. Food. <laughs> but yeah, the uh, the conductor is being passed through this electrical wire. Um, it's a super interesting material. 
for us? Is the uh, black thing just that shield? Sorry, it's conductive, not electrical. <laughs> is, is the uh, black wire on that just a link of the filament then? As opposed to being a... I believe so, yes. I'm sorry? Is the black wire you've got on that, is that just a piece of the filament? It's a, yeah, it's a piece of filament. Yeah. Cool. That's as it comes off the reel. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. a yeah, flexible conductor, yes. Rewire and actuator. Ninja Tech do a really fun thing. So they name all their filaments like chinchilla, armadillo, and because it's electric, they call it eel. They specialize in doing a lot of flexible filaments, and they get like flexibles. Oh, that's where you get like the stupidly flexible stuff, isn't it? Mm. Uh, we chinchilla. showed you, was it chinchilla white that we showed him? Can we bring mm. a cube of it off? Yeah, there was a tiny yes. cube in one of the... It was yeah. like basically like mush, wasn't it, when you were holding yeah. it as a printed piece. Yeah. Um, but this is a short hardness of 90, hey? so it's, it's flexible, but it's not beyond the point of reasonable. Um, so you can still print with it, basically. It's chemically resistant to acid, solvents, and bases. So you can have it in an environment that's chemically harsh, and it won't dissolve. It has a 355% elongation of that break, wear or cracking. You can properly stretch it out and return back to its original form. We have other flexibles that Arabs passing around at the moment. It's carbon mixed in with the TPU plastic that makes it conductive. Right. So it's not any metals, additives, or anything like that. Um, I believe it is the only electrically conductive flexible finisher material, or it was at one point. <laughs> However, that is also ESD safe flexible. So if you needed a flexible that's got the opposite properties, like you needed a, a pad rubber-esque pad needed to resist electrical charges, they electronics that will have any weight pushed against them, you don't want them touching. We have ESD safe flexibles as well. It's basically the opposite end of the spectrum. You can actually use them in conjunction if you wanted to make an ESD flexible tube with the filament running through it. You could have a, a safely sealed electrical current running through that material, the eel, to create like a, an environment, whatever engineering use case you would need. Um, for any of the more engineering people, here is the surface resistance of the material for electrical transparency. Those uh, cheese wedges are nice, aren't they? Can you print that on an ender with a bone tube on it, or does it need to have direct? Very, very slow. You, you do have direct, it has a lot to be better. like 10 mm per second. Yeah? Yeah. You can print. print it, but it will be super <coughs> slow. So I, I believe the bigger cheese wedge, this one. I think it's a 90, yeah, 90 a short hardness. So. This was printed on the Ultimate 2, which is not direct, it's both. And I did that at five millimeters a second to try and get a good finish, because it failed a few times. It's actually a door stop by a door wedge. <laughs> not edible, it's not food safe. <laughs> Uh, I believe that's 98A. <coughs> so, uh, that might not necessarily be the TPU, but it is at zero. And with flexibles, you can print the same piece at different levels of infill and have it be more or less rigid. So if you print it at 20% infill, it's going to be more flexible than at 100% infill. If you look at the two pieces of cheese and feel them, that's at the large pieces are at a much higher infill, and the lower pieces are at much lower infill, and you can physically depress it with your hands. Mm. But you can't do that with the larger ones so much. No. That's the same material, is it? Uh, no, they're two different brands. One would be the 5 a that one, that one is Eason's uh, 83, sorry, 73 a short hardness, and this is 98 a by filament and plastic. So, um, if, is there a better type of print to print from? Could you use a direct drive for you print faster? Yes, yeah. you can print faster with the direct drive. Um, there is a specific uh, extruder part um, made by Flexion. Mm -hmm. So Flexion is a part of um, NinjaFlex or Diabase. Diabase is the mother company, you can say, and then the Diabase produces um, NinjaFlex and Flexion. So Flexion is specifically made for that one. They do produce another material which is specifically available on the Flexion website, which is 60 a short hardness. They call it jellyfish. It's super, super flexible, and it only prints with the Flexion extruders used. Otherwise, it won't print at all or print properly. Um, so that's how flexible is. Printing with the more rigid and flexibles. Like the more flexible you go, the harder it gets to print with as well. So if you're printing like a 90, it's hard to print in a 95. 
just because if you're building especially a tall model as the pieces as the extruder is going over it it's going to be more you understand one of the things with uh, flexibles uh, we are saying it works better with direct drive versus bogan is that down to the uh, inner diameter of the bogan tube because if it's more flexible you can yeah. So yeah, sort of you have a very you know, short gap. But you get stuff like the uh, Capricorn shoe that's got a more constrained inner diameter. It can technically, yes, but not 100%. The reason for that <coughs> is that the distance between the gears pushing through your material to the hot end is very, very short. So there is no bigger room around it. So even if you use the normal tube or a Capricorn tube, you would have a nice results with a direct drive. Right. Um, if you do do use the Capricorn, you would have a better results than the normal one, which will have a bigger diameter inside, like two mil compared right. to 1.8, 1.9. Um, uh, but end results the better or faster because you can go faster. The direct drive is going to be the best option, yeah. but if you've got bones, our, our advice for yeah. mileage may vary. Like you can do it. But we need, there's no like guarantees so or anything If you like do that. do use bottom, you can do overcome by either over extruding tiny bit, so five percent go over extrusion, so it will compare with the big leanness in the bottom tube itself, so that will compensate for that one, and print it slower and tiny bit more hotter, so that will uh, um, resolve the issue for that. We do samples of a large amount of materials that we sell. I would recommend if you've never printed flexibles to get a flexible sample and do tone it into what exactly you need and figure out the settings before you go out and buy like a, a whole spool of it because it, it is a more difficult material to print with. Um, especially if you've got a bowden, buy a sample, see what you can do with it and if you can't, you, it is what it is. But if you can manage to get it to work, that's fantastic really, isn't it? Um, but I think, does anybody have any other questions about the eel or flexibles or conductive materials in general? Because we do offer a wide array of other conductive, electrically conductive materials, more is rigid it? stuff. Is it at the point where you could uh, 3D print a PCB type arrangement? Stuff that you could say solder to? Um, yes and no. The reason it's a controversial answer is because if you're printing a single layer or two layers, the conductivity on that layer would be less compared to if you're printing the same material with uh, 20 layers. So you would not have a consistent results um, when mm. you're uh, powering it up. So the resistance would be higher. Right. So technically it can be possible, but the results may vary kind of thing. Mm. The, track, <coughs> the track resistance would be a lot higher than the PC. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Because it, it, it depends on what you actually need it for. Yeah. Um, no, I was just curious because, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you had your head. It will affect the circuits. One standard. You cannot really. And it's printing like traces in. It can't be traces in with. It can't be no different kinds of charge resistance that you can deal with on that sort of piece. And it's a carbon based as well. But yeah, it's not. Naturally, it got much better. People have done it before. We've got it to work. You'd have to really get your tolerances quite high. I would probably be easier to do that under rigid. Conductive material as well, because we have like more standard PLAs and PETGs, yeah, electrically conductive, which is easier to print with. Um, you could always print the shell if you only have one uh, extruder. You could always print the shell of it, print the flexible out, and then poke it in to like a frame, can you? Yeah. So you could have a non conductive or ESD even safe material, poke in the flexible eel conductive, like create a bridge that it pops into, and create a trace that way if you needed to do something. Yeah, I suppose you could try the whole uh, Z-Bot thing as well. So you mm -hmm. print your traces, mm -hmm. use that pattern and create a hole in another model and then literally print directly over it. Oh yeah, yeah. Just like create a negative, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Electrically conducted plastics now are always very strange for people anyway, so... The electrically conducted flexible TPUs is nice. Um, it's done by mixing carbon into it to give it its electric conductivity. The ratio of 18% to 82% TPU. Did we, anybody else? Next slide. Yeah. Ah, so this is Reflow, 100% recycled PET. Reflow is a company that specializes in 100 or 98% recycled materials. Their PET is 100% recycled. They get all of their plastic from a 
like a trace source from the Netherlands, they know it's all recycled plastic. It's heat resistant up to 80 Celsius, so it's fine to use if you wanted to put the veil in front of your car or something. Most environments, it's not going to get past 80 Celsius. I believe that's what the car won't, won't get up that much, especially in Arizona, in the desert. So in the UK, it would be perfectly fine with that. It comes in 12 colors. They've got transparent and standard. Um, the bins that we printed out with it today are just one layer of vases. But PC, uh, P E E T G. It's got a very, it's got a different texture to PLA. It's more silky, it's more smooth on like the the, the feel of it. And uh, when you are done with it, it can be recycled once again back into PCG. It can be used for other purposes. It's a recyclable so, material. So this could just go straight to standard recycling. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, can, it can be like a cyclical thing. We can be recycled and then turn back into filament. You can 3D print and then recycle and then turn back. It creates a circular sort of economy kind of deal. And uh, the PTGs can also have high translucency. So you can have like really well see through parts, and it's hard to get that with PLA materials. That's good. Unfortunately, the, the lighter one had uh, been damaged in delivery today on its way here. Yeah. But you are able to build like high strength parts out of PET G if you just make them think that that's just a one layer vase. <coughs> we have a bunch of those in like a million different colours as well. But we figured like one or two would be enough. I think it just makes a little tail coming up with it and then we can all do that. Face it. <laughs> Where I started on the uh, whole headphones thing, they were advising PTG because PLA would get attacked by oils and stuff. What are you wearing? Oh, from your skin? Yeah, from your skin and from your hair. PTG is uh, one of the most popular 3D printing materials. Yeah. Ideal uh, would be to use polypropylene. Uh, polypropylene is very underrated material. It's non-toxic. Um, it's not much easier to print to, yeah. to start with, but yeah, polypropylene would be the ideal one. You would have to, on a normal bed, it won't stick properly, so you'll have to use a cellophane tip uh, because it's propylene tip, so it can stick to itself. We will uh, be covering polypropylene. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, they also do recycled PLA, and um, the recycled PLA is relatively fresh from what I understand. It's, it's got a lovely matte finish, very similar to the Polyterra, but they've got their own unique colours. Recycled, they're all recycled as well. They're all recycled. Yeah, everything comes from Reflow is recycled. recycled. Natural but products are 100%, the colour ones are 97%, the 3% takes by the colours. So. Um, but yeah, Reflow is a, is a great company. They're doing re recycled materials, and they've got. They, you can go on their website and see the tracing that they're doing, the sourcing of their plastics. And sometimes, with some foreign companies, they won't necessarily be providing all of that information. And or they'll say they've got recycled materials, but it'll only be like sixty percent of it's recycled versus one hundred percent or ninety nine percent. So having one hundred percent recycled materials is like it's, it's fantastic for the environment. So if you want to go to the next slide. Polypropylene. <laughs> One of the toughest materials that we do. This has been run over with seven tons. It's been run over with seven tons. A flatbed truck with a van on the back. This very brick. Ran it over. That way around. Over the top, it was on a plinth of two pieces of wood. So we've got the full weight of the vehicle. We stopped on it, took some pictures, and then drove it over the top. It's been hit with a hammer several times. That's what the damage is from blunt force impacts as hard as I possibly could. You can see all this, we uploaded a video to our YouTube channel, you can see us absolutely abusing this brick. Um, the curving is from walking on the bed, but we didn't use enough for teaching. It's not from the actual running over of the piece. Uh, it's incredibly, super, super strong. It's polypropylene mixed with glass fiber, so it's not, it, regular polypropylene is food safe, this is not food safe. If anyone can break it, I'll give you a hundred quid. Five there's, so, there's so many tools. There's so many tools in this you place. Could, you could probably like smash a sledgehammer with it. To be honest, that's only seventy-five percent infill. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a very oh, yeah. material. I'm hampered with point four millimeter nozzles. It's thirty percent glass fiber. Um, we've hit it with a hammer. I ran it over with my one point two ton car at like about fifteen twenty miles an hour. Just like ran it over. Um, what else do we do with it? Stood it across two pallets and jumped on it, so yeah. it's like taking the full weight on one foot down the middle. It's tougher than a full body weight on it. You could smash real bricks with it, it's that tough. 
If it was 100% infill, it'd probably be actually bulletproof. I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> a pretty good crack the whole way through, isn't it? Yeah. I think your, your 100 quid might be in jeopardy. You can go, if you can break it, go for it. <laughs> don't hurt yourself, please. <laughs> On the um, on the top side though, you can see you get you can get a really nice finish. Yeah. Where it hasn't been hit with hammers, run over with cars and vans and trucks and all that sort of stuff. We uh, initially we were filming it because we were like, look how strong it is until the point that we broke it and we couldn't break it with seven tons. Our last idea was to use a pneumatic press, mm -hmm. but we decided to call it a quits at seven tons. We calculated on that one wheel that was sitting on it was seven tons across the bridge of the material. Um, it's super dimensionally stable, so you can make like really, really high strength pass immediately. Something that's going to create an immense amount of force. It's absolutely fantastic for all of that. It doesn't absorb any moisture, it doesn't require any drying. As I said, you can dry bread in yourself. It's kept resistant to a whole whack of stuff. And this is all certified from the manufacturers, so they give like specific compounds and things, which are like fantastic use cases. Now, normal polypropylene is a food safe material. So if you want to make water bottles out of it, for example, if anybody have a reusable water bottle with them today? No? Okay. Um, you can, the reusable, like Evian, mine's metal, unfortunately. <laughs> like an Evian water bottle, that can be made out of polypropylene, or like one that you buy from Aldi's, like a reusable one or something like that. Jeez. As well as Petty. Um, but you can reuse polypropylene products, and they're constantly food safe, and it's all good. Um, Glass fiber is not, because the glass fiber is a mixed thing. <laughs> but polypropylene is like a very popular 3D printing material for its food safe capabilities. And it just so happens that in this particular mixture they've had it, they used polypropylene. So does the strength come from the glass fiber, or is it quite strong just as a as PP on its own? Uh, polypropylene is quite strong, but yeah. the glass fiber just has so much more to it. The, uh, the Blunt force like resistance and like pure tensile strength is just so good on that stuff. Even with the crack, nobody seems to have managed to get that hundred quid. <laughs> Actually, I've got some rubber bags in the car. <laughs> it uh, has a relatively high heat resistance, but its heat deflection temperature isn't hot enough to actually be used in for internal car parts. But you could use it for things like <coughs> something that isn't like a direct engine. Because if it's an area of like suspension, you could use it to make suspension or like that. Yeah, I've seen some three D printed suspension report, uh, supports recently. Mm. I don't think it was something like that. Though. Well, if you're making it for like a big Land Rover or something, maybe you'd want to. <laughs> yeah. But you have to make sure you print the layer lines the correct way. Because if you did it the wrong way, it could be brittle in a certain direction, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because the lines that the layers are printed on are always more susceptible to breaking in that direction. So if you printed it that way, it'd be stronger mm -hmm. to this sort of tension. Do you want to go to the next slide? Ah, mold laid by clay path thing, Kai path thing. Uh, Aaron mentioned him earlier. He's a German engineer, pretty much just like a one-man band. This is a wax light material. It's, uh, it's very weird. It can be used to create negative <coughs> metal mold, uh, concrete and such. Uh, it remains rigid at room temperature. It's, a, it's, it's just a very... Kai Parthi does so many weird and wacky materials. He does a material called Grolay, which is... <coughs> you 3D print it and then grass grows out of it, basically. He does... Um, <coughs> you get germinate seeds on them. Germinate seeds on them, sorry. Um, he just makes some of the weirdest stuff. He was the one of the first ones to do wood filaments. Wood filaments. That was his creation. He was also one of the first people to do foam-based materials. If you're interested in like really weird out there materials, Kaipathi is a great person to look at. Um, he, the reason we just brought along mold is because that's the sample we had. So that's an experiment to see if we could burn it as a candle. So your, your next thing will be 3D printed soap, I bet you. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> I give Eric the idea. Pretty much, pretty much. You can uh, only make molds. He did um, quite a lot of uh, dissolvable materials, some with alcohol only, mm. and of course with water and stuff as well. They do porolay materials. So the porolay material is a mixture of uh, plastic and PVA. Yeah. So when you print out the material itself, 
um, it, oh. when you put it in the water, it will dissolve the PVA part Sorry, and become that's... porous. So you can use it as your end soles uh, as well. Uh -huh. um, so you've got jelly, so the similar functionality when it's under water or it's in uh, watery body, it will be soft. But once it's dried, then it will be hard. So oh. you can give them all different uh, shapes and uh, have different kind of... What was this one, sorry? That's uh, not the one by Craig Parfum, but that's another called polysmoo. We use alcohol vapors to seep the layer lines off and remove the outer layers. Oh, okay. So you're able to get really, really unique finishes that you aren't able to get with other 3D printed pieces. A bit, bit like um, ABS, but more, even more smooth. I mean, that's fantastic. So there's a device called the Polisher. Uh, based material, so that's more like uh, near to printing wise, like a, a PLA kind of wow. material. So much easier to print, more enclosures and all that sort of stuff. There's, so a, there's a device called the Polisher, it, it's which specifically does the alcohol vapor polisher. for you, but it's nice for alcohol, you can buy it. So you, you can but you can also build your own polisher. polisher. The whole project was open but source. You can create your own, uh, so all you need to do is buy the materials, 3D print them. Print them. You print the thicker oh, layer lines, oh, so you can like three or four walls or whatever. So you have thicker walls, because the outside walls are actually being melted off. It doesn't work for really, really thin right. pieces, like if you were doing like a plate for example, or like a one layer thing. It just melts into goo. Um, but it doesn't leave any like after material, like it's not hazardous or anything like that. It's uh, it's really unique. We have a Conan the Barbarian bus and made in pink poly poly smooth. <laughs> and uh, it's it's just so good how it comes out. We've got before and after pictures now on the product page. But it's just it's un it's an unbeatable finish <coughs> if you want something like that. It's like a bubble gum. I'm sure the guys. They also come in a wide variety of colours. And <coughs> while the polisher is like a pre-built unit, it's very easy for people to assemble their own ones. There's guys and lines from poly making themselves. Materials they produce when they were manufacturing the materials, so how you can build your own alcohol vapor stations. Um, there are other materials that use acetone vapors and things like that to create the same effect, but it's a lot more hazardous, whereas alcohol vapors are very easy to obtain and they're not you're never gonna burn you burn your hand or anything without alcohol because uh, it's just like for a black at the end of the day. Great colleagues as well. We call them gas chambers, don't we? Do you want to skip unless anybody has any questions we can go to the next slide? Oh. No. Ah, so that's the end of it. There, there you go. Oh, okay, I'll go back. So it's just any general questions you have for either myself or Arif. Um, I know about materials and Arif is specifically, he's a designer so he knows about 3D modeling if you have any questions about anything like that. Anyone in the Twitch chat has any questions about 3D printing or just wants any advice even about your machines or any materials that you're interested in or anything <coughs> like that, just to ask questions basically. So these were quite a few of the materials, not all of them that we do have in stock kind of thing. So they were just briefly overview of a handful of materials in that perspective. Um, no, you cannot drink. Um, so yeah, there, are, there are other materials as well as as, as we got. Like uh, um, you guys heard of the PETG of the oh, environment. Yeah. We got P uh, PETCG, um, which is a next version of the PETG. Um, this is P. So. It's much more, or much stronger compared to the PETG itself. Um, it can retain higher heat. So, so the, the guys put the boiling water in that and kept its form. It didn't uh, deflect. It, it bit easier to print compared to the PETG with the stringy kind of thing. What's that? Uh, PETCG. PETCG. Okay. <laughs> this is the, uh, the remains of our little snowman. <coughs> Just pass that around. You guys have already had a little look at that. Oh, little fella. Uh, you guys can see the water so you can see that. See the remains of that. So it's been about an hour and a half now, hasn't it, since then? It's entirely gone. A little bit of snow down there. A little bit of snow down it, normally when you're doing it, you want a larger volume of water for it in. This is quite a small glass for it, but uh, we didn't want to bring you know, it in one of the two high Iron materials, and that was the core of one of the. We have all metal white demos. You don't draw it. Oh, you just got your ring. This is also <laughs> um, heat treating on the polytherapy LA to create a different finish. This is actually like sewage and slime for a DD board. Is that, is that in focus? 
Oh, that is one. What's the score through? So that's uh, iron. I think there's only one there. Yeah, well, that's iron. Iron. So this is probably so that's part of uh, uh, the internal core of our printer. Uh, the one that was talking about earlier. So that's the uh, one that's probably It's done a good job of that. It knows that. Um, I do not believe we have the other example of it, but the Polyterra iron, it just uses a weak gun, basically. <laughs> um, the higher grade materials we do, we do peaks, all tins, and all that sort of stuff. So, some peak, all tins, tins, tins. Yeah, but we have to be careful because it's a flat pad, so it's a little wall. Right. You get up there. Uh, but these machines, you would have to have a printer which is capable of printing 350 to 450 degrees temperature can retain about a uh, similar temperature in the chamber. Um, it's a bit of light ropes on the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Something that I didn't include in the PowerPoint, but I do want to talk about, Someone's is Francophil, which is a French company, making materials out of scallop shells, mussel shells, oyster shells, and beer, recycled biodegradable PLAs. So this is actually a coaster made out of recycled beer waste from a brewery in Normandy. It prints just like standard PLA. Semi-transparent, if anybody wants to hold that up for the light. Recycled beer, though, just sounds wrong. <laughs> it's beer waste. <laughs> it's, it's beer waste, so it's... It's, um, it's, it's the stuff I'd use to make my mind, basically. Uh, not even that quality of stuff. Um, a significant percentage of when they're producing ales and beers and stuff to the bottom of the barrel, literally. What does it smell, Tim? It smells all it's something. Really. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you don't have the? It's not I'm absolutely certain. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when it's printing, it sinks out of the like an old sub, though. It'll sink out of the room. It's non-toxic, so it's more than healthy. It's the only yeah. ventilation yeah. I think you'll just smell. But when it's finished printing, the oyster shells and mussel shells that also smell, but it smells... It doesn't smell bad, whereas that's... If you like the smell of a pub, I suppose. <laughs> So if anybody's interested in looking for like food safe materials and stuff, we do do have food safe materials. So that's one of them. It's called non island, uh, made by Filamentum. Um, it's a food safe material, um, um, and it can be washed in dishwasher. So dishwasher safe. So dishwasher, as far as I know, it's 85 degree wash cycle. So. That's kind of a uh, temperature it take. You can technically put your coffee in it and drink it out of that cup. Uh, if you're interested in, let's say, food safes, we do have like a whole category on our website of all the food safe materials. So you can look through and just see everything that's food safe. And you can look at the MSDS sheets and the print requirements and see what you need to print that particular material. And we have categories for like medical stuff, <coughs> we have categories for uh, like every single kind of like typical property that we have on brands for. We have a, uh, a segment for all the carbon materials. It's, it's the sanitising afterwards or the sterilising, which is always very difficult, isn't it, with um, medical type stuff? Yeah, if, if, if the printer is just used for the food safe materials and it's been sanitised, then that would be perfectly. Yeah, if it's like uh, ourselves, if you're printing like the test prints of ABS and then afterwards. Food safe, then that wouldn't be any good at all is in that perspective. Is uh, if anybody is looking for flexible food safe, we do Filamentum 96A um, uh, filament, which is food safe, skin contact safe. So, for talking safe, if you guys are doing, or the people on the Twitch, they're doing cosplays and stuff, and printing the masks and stuff like that. Um, so, that would be ideal for that kind of thing. Generally, any plastic, uh, it's a non-toxic plastic, the reverse, but they do not advertise because they don't have the FDA approval for it. For the 96 ones, they do have the uh, proper approvals uh, and tested properly, so it is advertised as a sweet glass and so. Now, I was, was going to mention about the food safe flexibles. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have freebies as well if anybody wants anything, little cubes and spools and pens and stuff. <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, not for the people who, who didn't show up, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> show up for next one. We also have uh, a lot of these freebies are actually resin printed rather than FDM, which we haven't talked about today. It's a very interesting process, so you're able to get much, much finer details, much, much easier. And if you're printing multiple things with a resin printer, because it's just doing whole layers at a time with like a laser, with like an LCD laser screen. You're able to print like six or seven items and it doesn't add any more time onto the print. So you can have like 
say you're throwing something that's 12 centimeters, you can have something that's six, four, eight, and all running at the same time on the same machine, it makes it, doesn't make it take any longer. And when we've got our filler print resin materials, we might do a talk or something about different kinds of resins that are available. Because <coughs> we're, the resins that we're offering are mostly engineering based ones. Like things that you can put inserts into, the tough materials and you can drill. Yeah, they're uh, all the receiving, so definitely they would be engineering based. If there's any questions, from the Twitch <coughs> chat as well. Any general No, they just want to see more of you, so I've uh, killed the uh, presentation. They want to see more of me? <laughs> yeah, they want you full screen. Um, is there any models that you, that you want to show the Twitch stream in particular um, that we haven't seen passed around? Example of this is a resin print that's been painted by hand. Yeah. When the building's an example, you have to get really, really fine little details. We have uh, prints with articulated pieces that are printed in situ. So they're printed on the bed, take them off, crunch the leg, it's able to move. There's a wide variety of these available on the Thingiverse and things like that. Um, we are currently printing a gorilla head. It might be quite high and quite low. Off-screen, we have a 3D model that's been running for the whole presentation. So, a gorilla that was signed by my co Kevin. These are basically um, how to get clear, 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 we also have an RC R2D2 that a YouTuber named Sam Prentice has made for us. Silk. That's pretty printed in one piece and yeah. I think it's on coat three and those legs are done in that. They do indeed. The legs are fully pretty articulating. Pretty. Even backwards, look at that. Good old meter box. This is where you have the uh, alien egg over there as well. Oh, the gentle. That's our filler print matte material. Uh matte finish. <laughs> 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 Oh. Hey, we've got some in building one of those. The YouTuber named Sam Prentice made this for us. Mm -hmm. um, I believe he's got instructions on how we put his one, which is life size. It's not an R2D2, it's a different droid, but it's a similar type yeah. that goes into the cockpit. But yeah, it's great fun. If anyone wants to have a go. Quite simple to drive it around. It's got 3D printed wheels. 